Okay, so today we're going to talk about legal issues, quality assurance, and infection prevention. And so again, we're always going to go over the words, uh, the key terms. We're going to discuss three major categories of legal considerations. We're going to describe the types of laws that affect the practice of dental radiography, describe the Consumer Patient Radiation Health and Safety Act, uh, the components of an informed consent with regard to dental imaging, and also identify the individual who legally owns the dental images. So it is a dental assistant's responsibility to understand the laws that apply to you when you're exposing dental radiographs. Federal and state regulations cannot uh, control the use of dental x-ray uh, equipment to ensure high quality dental images and a low risk for exposure to patients and personnel a quality assurance program is necessary regardless of imaging technique use potential is always present for cross contamination of equipment and environmental surfaces if good infection uh, control procedures are not practiced so is something that you guys have to think about because we're in the patient's mouth. What's in the patient's mouth? Saliva. So if we're not careful, we can pr uh, spread this saliva everywhere from the buttons on the x-ray panel to um, the unit, to the light, to the chair, to everything that we touch while we're moving the x-ray machine. So kind of think about that. Now, legal considerations. There are three major categories of legal considerations regarding the use of images in dentistry, federal and state regulations regarding x-ray equipment and use, licensure for individuals exposing dental images, and risk management for avoiding potential lawsuits, and we'll go over each one, starting with federal and state regulations. The use of dental x-ray equipment is regulated by both federal and state regulations. All dental x-ray machines manufactured or sold in the United States after 1974 must meet federal regulations. These include safety specifications for minimum filtration and accuracy of the milliampere time and kilovoltage setting. All x-ray equipment is also subject to state, county, or city radiation health codes. So they usually come here um, basically on a, a regular yearly basis or whenever I call them and if I want to check the x-ray machines, they will come. Also, they come whenever a new one is installed, like our new lab. Uh, licensure requirements. The Consumer Patient Radiation Health and Safety Act is a federal law that requires persons who take dental radiographs to be properly trained and certified. So that's what's happening right now as you guys are in the lab. We take it step by step, uh, correct errors, and then we move on from there and we continue practicing. It is up to the individual state to determine its own policy regarding the qualifications of individuals exposing radiographs. X-ray certification requirements for the dental system vary from state to state. Some states even require certification by the Dental Assisting National Board. And then there's other states that may, may require an additional examination. Each state deals with dental radiography differently. I can tell you that the state of Florida does not expect you to take that Danby test, but if you do move uh, to a different state, you will have to take it. Risk management. Risk management policies are designed to reduce the likelihood of malpractice lawsuit against the dentist. The dental assistant has an important role in risk management. The DA must be careful never to say anything about the x-ray equipment or how it is working. Statements made without thinking, such as the timer must be off, this thing never works right, the solutions are weak, are unnecessary, and can make the patient feel uncomfortable. So we have to be careful, not only in x-rays, but I mentioned this to you guys in other things too. Okay, stay away from the negative comments. Even if something is not working, your patient doesn't need to know. Okay, fix it or get it fixed and then move on. Statements made by anyone at the time of an alleged negligent act are admissible as evidence in court. Informed consent, it is the dentist's responsibility to discuss the need for radiographs and treatment procedures with the patient. 
The dental assistant may participate in the process of obtaining informed consent. Patients must give informed consent for dental radiographs as well as for other procedures. So usually when they come in, uh, especially a new patient, it is um, up to the dental assistant to explain what's going to happen because normally they do not see the dentist first, they see you first. So you uh, grab them from the reception area, you bring them in, you say, uh, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, uh, today you're here for a new patient exam. That consists of a full set of x-rays and then the doctor will come in afterwards to check your x-rays and give you a treatment plan. You know, these are the things that if you guys, you basically start saying it after every patient, it will become the norm for you. And you should always discuss everything that you're doing with the patient. If today is a cleaning, if today is a filling, if today is a crown and bridge, you must let them know what we're going to do today. And then we have informed consent and signed consent. Some things you tell them, you're informing them, and some things you're gonna have them sign it. Things like extractions, you have them sign it. Things like root canals. Big procedures, you usually have them sign. X-rays is really more, um, I'm going to do this, and then you let them know, so you're informing them. Liability, under state laws. Um, oh, I skipped one, I'm going back. For valid informed consent, the patient must be provided with the following information in lay terms, the risks and benefits of radiographic procedures, the person who will be exposing the radiographs. Yeah, that's another thing that um, you guys should do. Hey, you know, you should say your name. Hi, my name is, you know, so-and-so, and I will, I will be taking your x-rays today. Now, remember, if you're doing digital imaging, then you will be saying, that I will be taking your images today because x-rays are x-rays and imaging are imaging, okay? Um, when a patient asks you what's the difference, at this point you should be able to tell them what's the difference, okay? Now the person who will be exposing the radiographs, the number and type of radiographs that will be taken, <clears throat> if it's an FMX, a full mouth set of x-rays, I wouldn't say 18 because it sounds like a lot, I will just say full mouth set of x-rays and they'll figure it out. You know, now if they do say how many is that, then you can say 18. But if you start off with, I'm taking 18 x-rays, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. They're going to start complaining, yada, yada. So you just say a full set of x-rays of their mouth, uh, especially because they're brand new and we need the foundation. Okay. The consequences of not having the radiographs, any alternative diagnostic aids that may provide the same information as dental radiographs. If you go back to my first email that I sent you guys, I sent you how to explain x-rays, okay? And you really wanna read that handout because that handout actually was taken, um, they, a lot of offices use that handout and they basically uh, give that to the patient to inform them of what's going to be done and why is it necessary and how safe it is and things like that. Liability. Under state laws, the supervising dentist is legally responsible or liable for the actions of the dental auxiliary, which is us. This is called respondent superior doctrine. It means that the employer is responsible for the actions of the employee. I believe that's one of your key terms. Even though dental assistants work on the, the supervision of a licensed dentist, they can also be held liable for their own actions, okay? So anything that you do maliciously, you can be held liable. So remember that. Patients' records, whether it is conventional film or digital images, they are part of the patient's dental record and are regarded as a legal document. It is very important to document the exposure of dental radiographs. The number of films exposed as well as the quality of the radiographs may be an important issue in a malpractice suit. Radiographs are of, that are of poor quality and are non-diagnostic reflect poorly on the dentist. Okay, so I mean, non-diagnostic radiographs are sometimes unavoidable, but a competent technician can keep these to a minimum find what you did wrong and retake them. And then no, you know, don't make the same mistake again. 
Documentation of dental radiographs. So the dental record must include the following information. Informed consent, the number and type of radiograph exposed, the rationale for exposing the radiographs, and the diagnostic interpretation. So for example, you would have today's date, 11-3-2020. Uh, you will put new patient exam, FMX taken. Um, um, you will write also inform patient. And so now we already inform patient. We have the number, the type, uh, the rationale is the new patient exam. And then the doctor will come in and do the diagnostic interpretation because we don't, okay? The dentist does. So ownership of dental radiographs. A lot of patients have this uh, very confused. So it's important that you guys know this. Dental images are the property of the dentist. Even though the patient or the patient's insurance company paid for them. This is because dental radiographs are a part of the patient's records. So again, remember that part. Patients may request a copy of their images. This request should not should be written and signed by the patient. So if the patient wants x-rays, they need to sign a consent releasing them. Okay, make an entry in the chart stating when and to whom duplicate or digital dental images were sent and never give or send original radiographs to a patient. So we never give them the radiographs, uh, the original ones. We always give them duplicates. Uh, it is okay, actually, that some doctors may even charge for it. It's up to the office, okay? So there are many offices that do charge for copies of x-rays. Uh, also note that um, if it's a patient's x-rays, then it's usually the patient or anybody that they sign in the chart that can come and release them. If it's Joe Schmo, no, the neighbor from down the block or whatever, and you did not have that person in the patient's chart, they should not be signing out for anybody's x-rays. You need to be careful about that because it can come back to you and the patient can say, I didn't um, give authorization for Joe Schmo to pick these x-rays up. And um, you're like, oh, you know, even if they said it over the phone, how do you know that's the actual patient? You have to have that person, again, in their chart saying, I release records to uh, such and such. And then if they come and pick it up, they can sign out for it. Uh, dental images and other dental records should be retained indefinitely. Statutes of limitations may vary. The question of when to destroy or discard a patient may, a record may not always have a simple answer. Patients' records and computer data must be stored carefully so that they do not become damaged or lost. Computer files should always be backed up both within the dental office and at an off-site storage facility. Nowadays, backup is done like on flash drives, um, um, different types of flash drives, not only the USBs, but the big ones that the offices use. So however they put it. Digital file security and advantage of digital files is that they can be sent over computer networks. You must check with local, state, and federal regulations about patient confidentiality. It may be necessary to encrypt the files or use virtual private networks, uh, the VPNs, rather than sending files over the public internet. So again, off-site backup is a great idea to prevent loss of information, but it must be secure. Also, another reason to um, um, back up your files, for instance, I worked in an office that when we had a hurricane hit, it flooded the office. Thank God we have backup files, otherwise, because everything was on digital. Uh, otherwise, we would have lost everything because the, the computers all got messed up. But again, we had all the files on backup. Um, another office, not that I worked there, but I knew of it, uh, caught fire. So they lost their stuff, but thank God they also had backup. So things like that is really super important to have backup. Patient refusal of dental imaging. So when this occurs, the dentist must decide whether an accurate diagnosis can be made without images and whether treatment can be provided. In most cases, a lack of images compromises the patient's diagnosis and treatment. 
The use of dental radiographs is now the accepted standard of care. So again, the uh, doctor is the one that decides, not the patient. They can tell you, um, you know, that they don't want it, and uh, you can tell the doctor, and the doctor might tell you to let them know that they would have to unfortunately cancel their appointment because he needs x-rays for diagnostic. He might even change it and say, well, do they have a problem? And maybe instead of taking an FMX, just take the area that's bothering them and we will still need an x-ray of that one area. So it all depends on the situation. But again, you need to discuss this with your dentist. Uh, every effort should be made to educate the patient about the importance of dental imaging. No document can be signed that totally releases the dentist from liability for treating a patient without dental, taking dental images. Even if the patient suggests signing a release or waiver that will release the dentist from liability, it will be considered invalid if an injury were to result. It should be recorded in the patient's record if a patient refuses recommended images. The dentist must then choose whether or not to continue to treat this patient. Uh, patient education. A dental assistant should understand and be sensitive to patient concern and fears about exposure to radiation during dental imaging. The dental assistant is often the person to whom the patient feels most comfortable confiding these fears. The dental assistant can explain to the patient just how important dental imaging is in detecting diseases and planning treatment. Patients can be informed of the federal and state laws enacted for their protection. Education materials are available. And as I said, uh, week one, I send you a handout with education materials, and that's pretty uh, much the standard of what they have in the office to explain x-rays. Does anybody have any questions so far before I continue? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, we're going to no. talk about, okay, insurance in the dental office. Okay, we're gonna name the annual test recommended for x-ray equipment, describe quality control uh, tests for processing solutions, including the use of a reference radiograph and step wedge. And we're gonna describe the components of a quality assurance program. <clears throat> so quality assurance in the dental office is a way of ensuring that everything possible is being done to produce high quality diagnostic images. It includes both quality control tests that monitor dental x-ray equipment supplies and image processing. It also involves quality administration procedures, including keeping schedules of maintenance and recording uh, of and record keeping logs. We also have quality control tests and there are specific tests that are used to monitor dental or x-ray equipment, supplies and film processing. Tests designed to identify minor malfunctions include variations in radiation output, inac inadequate collimation, tube head drifting, errors in timing, inaccurate kilovoltage and milliampere readings. The American Academy of Dental Radiology recommends a number of annual tests for dental x-ray machines. And note, when not in use, always leave the tube head and extension arm in a closed position, okay? Try to remember that. Again, always leave the tube head and extension arm in a closed position when not in use. And uh, the weight of the tube head on an open extension arm can weaken the unit and cause the tube head to drift during exposure. So that's one of the, uh, another reason why it drifts, because the weight of it is weakening the unit. So again, always leave the tube head and extension arm in a closed co uh, position when not using it. Now, different types of quality control tests, dental film. We want to test each new box for freshness. The x-ray machine, calibrate equipment regularly. Cassette and phosphor plates, clean and examine for scratches. Safe lighting, we check for light tightness in dark room. The automatic processor, we're gonna follow the manufacturer's recommendation carefully regarding maintenance. And the manual processor, we're gonna replenish daily and change every three to four weeks. Something with the manual, we would have to uh, make sure we keep a separate log. The automatic processor lets you know, so that's the good thing about that. And everything else that you wouldn't know who checked it, 
uh, because it doesn't have something automated, you are supposed to keep some type of log and basically every month at least, uh, and if not more often, you write on this log, you know, today's date, check film, x-ray machine, cassette, phosphor plate, safe lighting, and manual processor. And of course, if the automatic processor say was not um, autom uh, automatic that it tells you, then you would write that on the list too. Regulations require that dental x-ray machines be inspected periodically. Some state and local regulatory agencies provide inspections of dental equipment without charge as part of their, as part of their registration and licensing procedures. Dental x-ray machines also must be calibrated or adjusted for accuracy at regular intervals. These tests are easy to perform and require only basic test materials and test logs to record the results. X-ray machine quality control test steps. We test output of X-rays, the size of the focal spot, tube head for stability, timer for accuracy, the milliampere, and the kilovoltage. The X-ray film, we check each box of film while opening it. Uh, we follow these steps to test film for freshness. In the dark room, we are wrap one exposed film from the newly opened box. We process the film with the use of fresh chemicals. We check the results. And if the processed film appears clean with a slight blue tint, the film is fresh and has been properly stored and handled and is safe to use. If the processed film appears fog, the film has been improperly stored or exposed to radiation and must not be used. So as you know, we keep the film in our cabinet. Believe it or not, some people keep it in the uh, in their fridge, but only you know a fridge uh, for uh, materials and things like that that belongs to dental, not for lunch. Okay, so just remember that if you see some materials in a refrigerator, then that means do not store your lunch there. Phosphate storage plates, reusable, uh, requires less radiation exposure than film screens and cassettes intensifying screens inside the extra oral cassette, which we talked about uh, in our last lecture, extra oral are your panel and your CEF should be periodically checked for dirt and scratches. Screens should be checked monthly with a commercial available cleaner. And after cleaning, an anti-static solution should be applied to the screen to prevent static electricity. Screens that appear visibly scratched should be replaced. Cassettes should be checked for worn closures, light leaks and warping which may result in fogged and blurred images. Damaged cassettes must be repaired or replaced. All those you can buy at uh, whatever dental company that you use for supplies. Uh, steps to test the cassette for adequate film screen contact. In the dark room, you're gonna insert one film between the screens in the cassette. You're gonna place a wire mesh test object on top of the loaded cassette and you're gonna use a 40 inch target film distance direct the central ray perpendicular to the cassette. And you're gonna expose the film with the use of 10 MA 70 KVPs and 15 impulses. Process the exposed image and view the film on a view box in a dimly lit room at a distance of six feet. 60 impulses is one second exposure. So 15 impulses is how long, who knows? It's one quarter of a second, one quarter of a second. All right, and then continuing steps to test the cassette for adequate film screen contact. You're gonna check the results. If the wire mesh image seen on the film exhibits uniform density, there was good image receptor screen contact has taken place and the cassette and screen are safe to use. If the wire mesh image that can be seen on the film exhibits varying densities, poor receptor screen contact has taken place. And if the film screen contact is poor, the cassette should be repaired or replaced. Again, this should uh, have a log and every month it should be checked and um, you would write it down on the log. Also, you would initial it. So that way, if anybody has any questions on who did it, you can go to that person and uh, double check with them. View boxes. A properly functioned view box is necessary for the interpretation of conventional radiographs. The view box contains fluorescent bulbs that emit light through an opaque plastic or plexiglass front, and the view box should emit a uniform and subdued light when functioning properly. 
The view box should be per periodically checked for dirt and discoloration of the plexiglass surface. The surface of the view box should be wiped clean daily. Permanently discolored plexiglass or blackened fluorescent bulbs must be replaced. Dark room lighting, lighting, check the dark room for light leaks every six months. While standing in the dark room, turn off all the lights, including the safe light. Once your eyes become accustomed to the darkness, look around the room for any signs of white light. Check the results. If the dark room has no visible light leaks, the room is safe for processing films. If light leaks are present, they must be corrected with weather stripping or black electrical tape before film processing is continued. There's a coin test to use uh, to check the safe light. You can turn off all the lights in the dark room, including the safe light, unwrap one exposed film and place it on a flat surface at least four feet away from the safe light with a coin on top of the film. Turn on the safe light and allow the film and coin to be exposed to the safe light for like three to four minutes. Remove the coin and process the film as us usual. Check the results and if no image is visible on the film, the safe light is functioning and it is safe to process other films. If the image of a coin and a fog background appear, the safe light is not safe to use with uh, that type of film. And here is a uh, example of what I just mentioned. Now, you know, when you're not doing this on a regular basis, I would say refer back to your book because even people in the office tend to forget because it's only used uh, or done once a month. So you just have to make sure that somewhere in the uh, uh, dark room or in the office, these directions are there so you guys don't forget and you're doing it properly. Film processing, perform quality control procedures routinely. Film processing is one of the most critical aspects of a quality control program. It must be monitored on a daily basis. And again, you have your manual and your automatic. With your manual, there's a thermometer and a timer that must be checked for accuracy. The temperature and levels of the water bath developer and fixer solutions also must be checked and strictly following the processing times and temperature recommendations of the solution manufacturer. With automatic processing, you're going to check the water circulation system, the solution levels, the replenishment system, and temperatures. And we're always going to follow the manufacturer's procedures and maintenance directions carefully. And each day, you should process two test films in the automatic processor. Follow these steps to verify, verify the functioning of the automatic processor. You're going to unwrap two unexposed films, expose one to light, process both films in the automatic processor, check the results. And if the unexposed film appears clear and dry, and if the film exposed to light appears black and dry, the automatic processor is functioning properly. If the unexposed film does not appear clear and dry, or if the exposed film does not appear completely black and dry, the automatic processor must be checked. Again, we're very lucky. We have one that tells us a lot. The, the biggest error with the one that we have is operator not following um, instructions that the automatic processor is letting them know. Processing solutions. The most critical component in the quality control of film processing, you must replenish the process solutions daily and change them every uh, three to four weeks as recommended by the uh, uh, manufacturer as an alternative to using the calendar to determine the freshness of solutions. Quality control tests can be used to monitor the strength of the developer and fix the solutions. You should check the processing solutions each day before any patient films are processed. So developer is depleted by air over time. Even if it has not been used to process film, you will see it turn yellow as it ages. So that's a uh, key in the that it will need to be changed, okay? So as the developer loses strength, the time temperature chart is no longer accurate. Uh, an easy way to check the strength of the developer solution is to compare film density against a standard, and this can be done with a reference radiograph or step radiograph. So basically, uh, in other words, um, you could test, you can do a test X-ray when you uh, put the developer in and save that text X-ray, and then kind of every time uh, as you're going along 
and you're checking your x-ray, you check with that test and that's how you know if the developer is still good or not. Also, honestly, if you are keeping a log and you're changing it accordingly, then you uh, will know when it's time to change it by keeping a log. Uh, re reference radiograph to create a reference radiograph, expose fresh film using correct exposure factors, process the film using fresh chemicals at the recommended time and temperature, view the reference radiograph and the daily radiograph side by side on a view box and check the results. If the density seen on the reference radiograph match the density seen on the daily, the developer's solution strength is accurate, adequate. If it appears darker, uh, then those on the reference radiograph, then the developer is either too concentrated or too warm. Weakened or concentrated developer solution must be replaced. And if the developer solution is too warm or too cold, the temperature must be adjusted before patient films are processed. So that's um, with, especially with the automatic, that's one of the reasons why we want to turn it on before uh, we don't want to like take x-rays and then go and turn on the processor. We want to turn it on when we first walk in. So uh, it's warming up and then we can go and take x-rays. So while we're taking x-rays on the patient, by the time we walk back to the processor, it's probably already warmed up by that time. A step wedge radiograph is a device that is constructed of layered aluminum steps. When a step wedge is placed on top of the film and then it is exposed to x-rays, the different steps absorb varying amounts of radiation. When the film is processed, different densities are seen on the dental radiographs. And the steps to create step wedge radiographs use a total of 20 fresh films. Now, honestly, I'm going to tell you that a lot of offices did away with this because they were wasting film. OK, um, so you might not see this being done. Basically, the things that we talked about in the beginning about checking the boxes for expiration dates, making sure that the box is fresh, keeping them stored properly, things like that. If you're doing all that, you really don't need to do the step wedge. But if you are, again, you're going to use 20 fresh films. You're going to place an aluminum step wedge on top of one film. You're going to expose the film and then you're going to expose the remaining fills using the same exposure factors. You're going to use fresh chemicals, process only one of the exposed films, and this process radiograph will exhibit different densities as a result of the step wedge. And it becomes the standard step wedge radiograph. Then you're going to store the remaining 19 exposed films in a cool, dry area protected from X radiation. Each day after the chemicals have been replenished, you're going to process one of the exposed step wedge films. And then you're going to compare the standard step wedge radiograph and the daily radiograph side by side on a view box. And again, you're going to compare the density seen on the daily ra radiograph with the density seen, seen on the standard. You're going to check the results. You're going to use the middle density seen on the standard step wedge radiograph for comparison. And if the density on the daily radiograph differs from that on the step, standard step wedge radiograph by more than two steps, the developer's solution is depleted and must be changed before patient films are processed. <clears throat> fixer strength, when the fixer solution loses its strength, the film takes a longer time to clear or become transparent in uh, unexposed areas. When the fixer is at full strength, a film should clear within two minutes. Uh, you're going to follow these steps to monitor the strength of the fixer. And again, it's pretty much sort of like the developer. You're going to unwrap one exposed film and immediately place it in the fixer. Check the film for clearing and note the amount of time that it that the film takes to clear. If it doesn't clear in two minutes, the fixer strength is if the film clears in two minutes, the fixer strength is adequate. If it does not completely clear in three to four minutes, it's depleted and then you need to replace it before you expose any more films. Quality administration procedures. So quality administration deals with management of the QA program that we talked about before uh, in the dental office. So description, detailed written description of the QA plan available for all staff men members. Monitoring, a written monitoring schedule should be posted in the office. Maintenance record keeping log of all quality control tests with specific details. 
Evaluation, written plan for periodic evaluation and revision of existing QA program. Training, in-service training for all staff members to upgrade and improve imaging techniques and processing procedures. So on occasion, the office may ask you to do what's called continuing education courses. And um, there are, are some great ones out there that are free. And then there's some that you have to pay for. And there's some that the dentist will pay for. OK, and you would all go to um, some sort of convention or something for certain training. X-rays is one of them because X-rays is always being uh, uh, modernized. And, you know, it's always good to update yourself on new information and other things in the office. So if you are told to go to a uh, continuing education class, you should, especially if the doctor is paying for it, okay? Anybody has any questions before I move on? We're almost finished, so hang in there. Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Discuss infection control. So we're going to talk about infection control. And if you haven't heard anything I said before these 50 something screens, this is like the most impre uh, inf important information to know. Uh, we're going to talk about the CDC. Uh, we're going to explain the requirements, the protocols, okay, of x-ray film storage plates, sensors, um, procedures during and after x-ray exposure and um, procedures during x-ray film processing. <clears throat> this is how I know starting tomorrow when we come into lab who's listening and who's not because we ne really need to be on top of our infection control. So dental radiography presents unique infection control problem control problems because of the potential for cross-contamination of equipment and environmental surfaces with blood and saliva. The operator places the image receptor film into the mouth, moves to the exposure control outside the operatory, and then returns to remove the image receptor or reposition it in the mouth. And it could be with the film, the PSP, or the sensor. It, it, we're talking all about the same thing can happen. There is also cause contamination in the darkroom when scanning the PSPs or when you use the computer in the mouth, the mouse. Direct digital imaging can reduce the potential for cross-contamination of surfaces caused by contaminated film packets or PSP wrappers and holders. Digital sensors and PSPs, however, require careful placement and removal of barriers to avoid contamination. The CDC has recognized dental radiology as a potential source of cross-contamination and has provided recommendations for dental radiology in the guidelines for infection control in dental health care settings. <clears throat> the radiography, uh, radiography operatory. So the first step in the preparation of the operatory is to identify the surfaces to be protected with barriers or disinfected with a high level surface disinfectant. In general, surfaces that cannot be easily cleaned and disinfected should be protected with barriers, usually plastic or foil. Surface barriers are preferred on electrical switches because of the possibility that the cleaner and disinfectant may cause an electrical short. Of course, the operatory should be prepared before the patient comes in. X-ray machine and lead apron, the tube head position indicator device, control panel, and exposure button must all be covered or carefully disinfected. The lead apron should be considered contaminated and wiped down with a disinfectant after each use. The dental chair, the back and arms of the chair, the headrest and the headrest adjustment controls must all be covered or disinfected. Once the radiography operatory is set up, you can set up the image receptors and holders. The work area where the films, PSPs or sensors and positioners are placed during exposure should be disinfected. Then a barrier such as a paper sheet, paper towels, or plastic cover should be placed. Once the procedure is completed, discard the barriers. If kind of surfaces are not protected by barriers or if the barriers have become torn or damaged, they should be cleaned and disinfected. So here's an example of somebody putting a barrier on the tube head, the chair, and then everything else. Just like if we were going to get ready for a patient to have a procedure done, we should really be covering this up because we're definitely going to be going in the patient's mouth where I, we wish 
saliva was a different color than clear because then you could see everything you're touching. Now, equipment and supplies. Before beginning the procedure, gather all necessary supplies to decrease the chance of cross-contamination. For example, think about the type or of film or sensor positioning devices, barrier sleeves, cotton rolls, and bite wing tabs, et cetera, that you may need. If you need additional supplies during the procedure, use overgloves. Food, they look like food handler gloves or ask for assistance. Um, I usually like to ask for assistance. Like if I see an assistant nearby, I would say, hey, can you pick this up or can you bring me this, that, or the other so I don't have to leave that room at all with saliva uh, gloves, you know, contaminating everything. Of course, if I have to leave the room, then I would take my gloves off. Now, the film and phosphor storage plates dispense the film or PSPs from a central area in a disposable container such as a paper cup. Film, PSPs, digital sensors, film and sensor positioning instruments. Film, once films are removed from their mouth, they are obviously contaminated and should be handled only with gloved hands. A technique used to minimize contamination is to place a clear plastic barrier envelope over the film packet. Some commercially available films are enclosed in a clear plastic barrier packet. Barrier protective film packets are exposed and taken to the processing area. The barriers are contaminated and one must remove them carefully without touching the inner packet so the packet can be handled with bare hands. PSPs are reusable and must be placed in a sealed barrier packet before exposure. Caution must be used to prevent cross-contamination when removing the plate from the barrier packet. So it looks like this. So these are for those PSPs, the phosphor plates, okay. Digital sensors and positioning instruments. So sensors cannot withstand heat sterilization or immersion in a high level disinfectant. CDC recommends at a minimum using an FDA clear plastic barrier. A barrier is placed over the sensor and part of the attached cable uh, unless a wireless sensor is used. Image receptor positioning instruments that are placed in the patient's mouth, like your XCP rings, are semi-critical that should be sterilized before reuse. The alternative is to use disposable positioners and discard them after a single use. Procedures during and after x-ray exposure. Operatory preparation during or, uh, dry, I'm sorry, drying of exposed film or PSP, collection of contaminated film PSPs, positioning instruments, disposable of contaminated items, hand washing and surface disinfect disinfection. So this is what you should be doing after x-ray exposure. So basically, taking off all the barriers, cleaning up the room, getting it ready for the next patient, or leaving it without barriers because the next person will come in and do it. Operator preparation. Always wear gloves and protective clothing when exposing images and handling contaminated items. You should also wear a mask and eyewear if there's a likelihood that blood or other body fluids may spatter. Masks are also indicated if you or the patient has a cough or a cold. And after putting on gloves, be careful not to touch any surfaces that are not covered, including your mask. Okay, I can't tell you how many people uh, place their hands in a patient's mouth and then they want to adjust their goggles or their mask. They should not, okay? Do all that before you put on the goggles. And placing the lead apron that's how you place the lead apron if it has a thyroid collar make sure you uh use the velcro to tighten it up and make sure that uh i usually tell the patient to lean forward and then you put the little flaps behind their back and then when they lean back it stays there because sometimes the velcro detaches the drying of exposed film or psp the contaminated film or psp packet is the major source of cross contamination during imaging procedures when you remove the film packet or psp from the patient's mouth it is coated with saliva or occasionally contaminated with blood especially if somebody has perio has an abscess had an injury they usually have blood in their mouth so super important so for this reason, you must always wear gloves while handling contaminated film packets or PSPs. 
After you remove each exposed receptor from the patient's mouth, wipe saliva off using a dry two by two inch gauze sponge or a paper towel. Do not attempt to sterilize the film or the PSP packet or sensor. We could also use the, um, the um, cavi wipes. We can also put them on a paper towel, use a little bit of spray and clean them that way. There's a lot of different ways to use it. We will learn that in lab tomorrow. Uh, some dental film manufacturers permit light spraying of the contaminated film pack with disinfectant spray, basically what I just mentioned. Immersion of the packet in a dis disinfecting solution can result in the solution seeping into the emulsion and dam damaging the image. So we will never immerse it into any type of liquid. It is always the best policy to check with the manufacturer regarding infection control protocol. Once dried, each film must be placed in a disp disposable container paper cup that is labeled with the patient's name. While glove, remove the seal barrier and place the PSP into a black transfer box. So that's, remember, just for PSPs, they have their own uh, transport box. These containers will be used to transport films to the dark room and PSPs to the scanner. If PSPs will be scanned immediately, there's no need to store them in the transfer box. Be careful not to touch the outside surface of paper cup or transfer box with gloved hands. And to prevent film fog caused by radiation, never place the container in a room where additional films are being exposed. Exposed film or PSP should never be placed in the operatory, oper operator's laboratory coat or uniform pack, pocket. Uh, positioning instruments. During exposure, always take the positioning instruments from the covered work area to the patient's mouth and then back to the covered area. Never place contaminated film holders on an uncovered surface. So normally I get a napkin, I place it on the tray, and then I put the XEPs on that napkin. So that way I can use that same napkin to walk to the um, cold sterile or to the sterilization area or the autoclave or wherever I'm going to take these in that napkin and I'm not ex like letting saliva drip out of the XCP tabs or anything like that. Um, some people will spray them in the room first before taking them out of the room. That's a good idea also. Disposable, uh, disposal of contaminated items. When you finish all the exposures, all contaminated items must be discarded and any uncovered surfaces must be disinfected. You must wear gloves while disposing uh, contaminated items, including disposable surface coverings, packet barriers, etc. All covered surfaces must be uncovered carefully. Be sure not to touch actual surfaces with gloved hands. Hand washing. After all contaminated items have been removed and disposed, remove your gloves and wash your hands. Surface disinfectant. Disinfection. While wearing protective eyewear and chemical resistant utility gloves, clean and disinfect any uncovered areas in the radiography operatory that were contaminated during exposure. Use hospital grade disinfectant that is registered and approved by the EPA. Transporting film, you should never touch the disposable container with your gloved hands. Only after the gloves have been removed, your hands wash and dry, the patient dismissed, and the area clean and dis disinfectant, you should carry the container with contaminated films to the dark room. You should always try to think in an organized, logical, and sequential manner. Do not contaminate the baffles of an automatic processor with patient saliva from film or gloves. So in other words, in our automatic processor, we have to put our gloved hands in through the sleeves. Well, we don't want to use dirty hands to put in through the sleeves. We have to use clean gloves. And, and also, we don't want to put uh, non-disinfected film in through the top of the automatic processor because everything that we touch from the buttons to opening up the packets, everything will be uh, uh, we would be doing cross contamination. So again, before we even go to the automatic processor, we have to make sure everything is super clean. Okay. At this time, do we have any questions? Um, yes, I have a question. Sure. Uh, the test today is due before 12 o'clock, correct? 
Correct. Uh, okay. I, I will actually give you to the class time till two o'clock. Okay, until two. Is that the same for the homework? Uh, the homework, I mean, if you don't have it ready,